WM. And tonight it gives me great pleasure indeed to uh, introduce my very own, well, not my own personal, but my own consultant, Dr. Helen McCarthy, who is a WM specialist and some down here in, on the sunny south coast in Bournemouth. So welcome to you, Helen. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thanks very much, Bob, and uh, welcome to everybody. It's fantastic to have so many people here join us this evening. Good, thank you very much. So, Helen, so perhaps you could start then maybe by giving us an overview, because I know we've got some new, some new WMers with us. Just give us an overview on what WM is. You're on, you're on mute, Helen. Sorry. Yeah. Glitches. Um, yes, yeah, so I've done a bit of a blue Peter job. So I've got a few slides because it's always um, I always find it easier having something visual. So people who who know me, I end up drawing lots of diagrams in the clinic trying to explain. So I've, I'll go straight to the slides and we can chat through them. Um, so here we go. OK, so everybody can see that. Hmm? Yep, that's good. You still hear me? Yep. So, yep. Um, so this is where I work in the sunny Bournemouth. Uh, it's a very nice hospital that's um, built around a man-made lake. So um, we're very lucky that we all have a, uh, whoops, spend time there in the summer. So um, I think it's always helpful to start with a definition of what Wallenstrom's macroglobulinia is. And it does cause quite a lot of confusion um, because we, we diagnose it, um, we need to look at the bone marrow because it's a lymphoma that likes to sort of head towards the bone marrow. And um, when the pathologists uh, we, and the haematologists, we look at the bone marrow, um, it's, you have this identity called the lymphoplasmocytic lymphoma. Now, you have to have more than 10% involvement of the abnormal cells. Um, and that together with this abnormal antibody um, or paraprotein, uh, that makes up uh, WM. So that's how we define it. First identified um, by this chap, Professor Waldenstrom, in 1944. And quite a lot of our um, international experts in, in WM, the number of the older folk are actually trained with this guy. So uh, he's really been a very, um, very informative to, to put all the sort of uh, symptoms together. So what is lymphoma? Um, I mean, basically, I think it's good to sort of think about sort of the basics and uh, um, the, the, the bone marrow is a, is a factory in the body that more, makes all of our blood cells. So essentially, we have three types, the red cells, and if those are low, you're anemic, platelets, which are the clotting cells, together with clotting factors, they get your blood to clot normally, and then white blood cells, and there are five different types of white blood cell. Now, the one that we're going to be particularly interested in is lymphocytes. Um, and when this cell undergoes a, a malignant change, it will then develop into a lymphoma. Now, there are about 100 different types of lymphoma, and um, broadly they're categorised into non-Hodgkin's lymphomas and Hodgkin's lymphomas. Um, WM is a form of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, I don't expect you to read that page for um, uh, a journal on the right hand side, but in small print um, WM appears uh, up here at this level. Now it's a rare lymphoma as you know, uh, the instance is three to eight per, per million people per year. In the UK we've got about 350 new cases um, of folk are diagnosed each year. Uh, tends to be more common as people get older, so it's an average age of diagnosis is above 70, although we do have quite a proportion of younger folk diagnosed as well. And there are some associations, so people who've got an autoimmune disease, um, they're more at risk, so things like um, Sjogren syndrome or polymyalgia rheumatica, um, some autoimmune hemolytic anemias, increase the risk of people going on to develop WM. Biggest risk factor is there's a condition called an IgM MGUS, um, and I'll explain a bit more about that later on. Um, but that that puts people in a much folk with this condition will have a much higher risk of going on to develop WM. Excellent. Can I can I just ask you, Helen, is, is WM or can WM be inherited? Well, that's a really good question, um, and I think that's a really a, you know pertinent question for. For many people, um, there's been quite a lot of, sort of you know, work on this, and the, the answer is no. In the majority of people, it just happens by chance, so it's what we call sporadic. Hmm? 
Um, there's been quite a lot of epidemiology sort of studies and big studies looking at folk with WM. Um, and an American group um, have published this. They looked at a, a cohort of 257 patients. Um, and they found that actually, if they, they did a big sort of questionnaire and asked about whether any of their relatives had any other blood conditions. Um, and quite a high proportion do. Um, you can see the graph here. I've just lifted it from the paper and it's, it's broken down. Um, so in fact, WM only, um, there were 5% of people roughly who'd had a, a relative with WM. Um, and there was a whole spectrum of other blood conditions. So it's not directly inherited, but we do now know that there are some um, genes, some pe people's genetic makeup, that makes them more susceptible. Um, and they've done, done some um, so big studies looking at sort of, uh, families, these very rare families that have been more than one case of WM, and they've identified these particular genes and, and spots uh, in the chromosome six and chromosome 14. Um, so the two susceptibility genes, that doesn't mean everybody that got those changes will go on to get WM. And it only explains about 4% of, of these sort of families that have you know, more than one member affected. So there's a lot more work to do, but, but no, I mean, the majority of cases, it just happens by chance. So, okay. so that sort of leads on to a, a second question. You probably bang ask me <laughs> <laughs> about <laughs> whether or not you should be, we should be screening people. Um, and I think it's, it's good just to have a, a sort of step back and think about, you know, if the instance is three per million, um, we do know that the um, if you've got a, a relative, a first degree relative, so that's a, um, a you know, brother, sister or, or um, father, you know, mother affected, depends on which sort of papers you look at, but they, there's thought to be this sort of three to 20 times increased risk that people may develop it, which sounds very high and sounds quite alarming. Mm. But they, what we need to look at is really sort of the relative versus the absolute risk. So even if um, you think about you, uh, it's going to be three times more likely, that will only give people a risk of nine in a million. So that's right. pretty okay. likely. Uh, yeah. even, even if you look at this, the worst case scenario, you're up to so 20 times more likely. Um, again, that's only 60, 60 people in a, in a million. So, mm -hmm. so we would have to screen an awful lot of people and cause lots of stress and anxiety or actually be very difficult to pick up these, these cases. So at the moment, we wouldn't routinely recommend that, that family members are screened. I mm -hmm. think the only caveat to that, obviously, if people get symptoms and they have problems with their health, then obviously it's important you know, they do see their doctor and, and you know, and always family history. Whenever I see uh, a new patient with WM, I always will take a, a family history and find out what else might run in the family. So, yeah. OK, That's thank fine. you. Does that answer that question? <laughs> it does. And uh, I, before you gave that advice and three or four years ago, I personally told my brother and sister to get checked and they both did and they were both negative. But yeah, there is a bit of anxiety there, I guess. Yeah, which I, which I think is, is natural. Um, and I think it's Im important research questions. So I think that um, if there are if there are folk, you know, that have not just having you know, more than one member of WM in the family, but if there are people that might have another blood condition, then I think it, it's really important that we do sort of you know, do you know, um, research, and we can do that very easily by just doing a spit test, and we we can actually screen and screen if we can pick up more of these susceptibility genes potentially. Mm. So, okay, thank you. Okay. So going back to some immunology, I spent a lot of time um, for my four years doing a PhD in immunology, so it's part of my my interest. But I think it's this looks like a bit of a busy slide, but I think it does help to explain a bit about how WM behaves. So normally these lymphocytes, um, they they're made in the bone marrow, and then they they go through different stages of maturation, and they circulate. They move from the bone marrow in the blood. They also move through our lymphatic system, which is another network of plumbing, um, into the lymph glands, um, where they you know expose to different infections, and then eventually they'll mature into making these these guys called plasma cells. And they're the antibody producing cells or antibody making cells. Now, if, a, if there's a sort of hit or something happens to any of these cells as they develop, um, they and the colour cancer, the cancer is frozen in that stage of maturation. And, and it basically, we can learn a lot by looking at the, um, the sort of outside sort of proteins on the cells, 
and also this thing which is an um, antibody or B cell receptor which you probably hear quite a lot about um, because it's relevant to some of the treatments we now use um, and um, they'll keep that same sort of molecular um, fingerprint if you like mm -hmm. uh, and so we can learn a lot by studying all these molecules on the outside of the cells um, and um, WM, you can see it's frozen halfway between this activated B cell and the antibody making cell. Okay. Now, bone marrow, as I've talked about, is really key. So to be able to diagnose WM, because it's lymphoma that hones you know, to the bone marrow, um, we need to look at that. And that's part of our diagnostic criteria. Um, so uh, this is somebody's bone marrow here. Um, and what we see, we see a mixture of those cells. Remember I, I was saying it's stuck between the lymphocytes, mature lymphocyte, and that antibody making cell, plasma cell. So can you see my point if I move that? I'm not sure. Yep, yep. So that's a plasma cell, that guy there. It looks like a fried egg, so a blue fried egg. Um, and then this is a lymphocyte here. There's another lymphocyte there. And then you see some that's sort of stuck halfway between the two. So that's trying to be, a, uh, it's halfway between a lymphocyte and trying to be a plasma cell. Um, and that's what we see. So it's a very typical sort of picture we see. And that's what, what we mean by the lymphoplasmacytic. It's, it's just a pathologist, a, a really all, all of their terms and um, come from how they, what it looks like down the microscope. And that's how they've uh, classified different types of lymphoma. Um, you can get, I think hematologists can get caught out um, because the IgM level doesn't necessarily correlate with whether or not people have got um, WM. So you can have a low level of IgM and still have WM. Um, and also it could be quite variable how much of you know, the lymphocytes we see and how much the plasma cell part of the disease. And that can change during the course of the disease as well. Okay. Now, because this, the bone marrow is not making the healthy cells, um, it's sort of making the bad cells at the expense of the good cells. This leads to some of our sort of key symptoms that we get with anemia and the low platelets and occasionally a low, low white cells as well. Now, um, the other thing that's important to say, and I think this is where sometimes people get confused, um, that the cancer cells or WM cancer cells, they can acquire changes in their genes. Um, and that's the genes themselves are a blueprint for proteins. So that um, tells the cell to go on and make proteins. And, and the proteins that the cancer cells make as a result of these changes that they've caused in, the, in their genes, um, help the cell to survive for longer, to grow faster than it should do, um, and all, all the things we don't want for the cancer. So um, Steve Trion, who's a you know, fantastic researcher in, in the States, has really done an awful lot of work um, in WM, um, basically used this technique that we can, we can look at all of the genes in the body. So it's called whole, whole genome sequencing. And it's looked to see whether there are any mutations or changes in, in all the genes that we've got. Um, and so what they did, they, they looked at, he took um, patients with WM and looked at their bone marrow cells. Um, and WM cells and compared to patients' own cells to see if there are any new mutations. And they came up with this really incredible finding that 91% um, of folk with WM have this very specific um, point mutation, such as one single change in the gene, which is mid-88. So really very remarkable finding. And these are all sort of genes that are that picked up as being changed compared to the, <laughs> the WM cells compared to the patient's own cells. And you can see the second most common thing is something called CRC, sorry, CXCR4, and that occurs in about 30% of people. Now, going back to sort of clinical um, classifications, uh, as I say, the, there's this condition called uh, IgM MGUS, and that's basically the, the lymphocytes are out of sorts but they're not, it's not a malignant um, state as such. Um, and the way we define it, people have to have a, a IgM power protein that's less than 30 grams per litre. There's no evidence of lymphoma in the bone marrow and they've got no end organ problems. So they have no, it's not causing any problems. Um, but we know that this can be a, a condition that can progress yes, and change. Hello. Hello. Um, Somebody turn their... Put themselves on mute, please, if you've just joined. Sorry, Helen, carry on. That's all right. 
Um, and so the rate of, of change from a, a, an MGUS to a WM is about 1.5% a year. So, so nowadays we've got a lot more patients that you know, we do look at antibody levels. So it's quite common that people have picked up at the MGUS stage. Um, and, um, and it can be a very, you know, as I say, um, you know, 90, 99% of people are not going to you know, change or 90%, um, but there is this proportion that each year that will progress to WM. So it's a bit of a spectrum. And in the middle, we've got this condition called asymptomatic WM. Um, so you've gone over that, that, that sort of key level of 30 grams with the, the uh, protein levels. And when we look at the bone marrow, we've got more than 10% of, um, of the lymphoplasmocytic cells um, in the marrow, but it's not causing any problems. And the other end of the spectrum is when um, WM becomes symptomatic and does cause problems. Okay, well that leads me on to uh, another question and, um, and I think you've just explained it there is a lot of us <clears throat> when we've been diagnosed with WM uh, to our horror we're told we've got a non-curable or incurable blood cancer and then we're put on something called active monitoring. Um, it's called watch and wait and old money but we now refer to it as active monitoring. <coughs> Why do we do that rather than starting treatment immediately? Yeah, it's another really good question. And I'm glad you said um, active monitoring. I've got, so I, I say to all my patients, um, you do find some hematologists still talk about watch and wait. I just think it's watch and worry. And I think it's a dreadful term because it implies something hideous is going to happen. Huh? Um, but actually, um, this is um, Bob Carl's data. So he's been um, following you know, patients. He's spent the whole life, lifetime and career really looking after folks with WM. has made a massive contribution to our understanding. Um, and what he's done, he followed uh, patients who had asymptomatic Waldenstroms. Um, and this is the chance of people progressing. And what's really important is the sort of figures underneath. Um, and that's really what we get from the, the graph. So, 61% of people with asymptomatic WM are not going to need any treatment for three years. Um, and if you actually go up to 32% you know, of people, again, are not going to need any treatment for 10 years. So it's really important just because we've you know, found this lymphoma, we don't want to over treat people. Um, so my philosophy is if it's not broken, we shouldn't be trying to fix it um, because actually the one of the problems, because at the moment it's an incurable disease, the cancer cells are very devious. So they can grow a resistance to treatment um, that they've seen before. So if you started treatment early with people and they don't, didn't need it in the first place, all you could do is, is actually grow as you know, cause that you know, WM to have a resistance to that treatment. Um, and then it's no longer gonna work when people really do need it in you know, you know, three, five or 10 years time. So really important that we, um, we're very careful that we, we've got some clear sort of uh, criteria when we want to start treatment. So, so it's a really, it's quite a good thing then to be told this and then be told that we're going to be actively monitored. So it means that uh, yeah. you know you know about it and that when the time comes, you're going to do something about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think it's, yeah, there's a big spectrum. I think for, it's really tough for, for you know, for you guys here, people be diagnosed with this and, you know, it, it's a, it's awful being diagnosed with any type of cancer and then be told, okay, you've got this cancer, but actually we're just going to watch you in the clinic. Hmm? Um, and I think it's quite difficult for people planning that, you know, sort of making life choices as well. I mean, if people are working, some to think, oh, you know, should I like, perhaps retire early or what should I do? And, what the American group have done, which I think is very nice, it's quite it's a recent publication. They've um, basically, again, looked at all, all of their patients, a very large cohort, and tried to sort of work out, are there any simple tests that we can help us predict which, which of the people are going to go on to need treatment sooner, and those, you know, which people are not going to need treatment so soon. So they're basically, it does involve, you have to have a bone marrow biopsy at, at uh, at diagnosis, so this is all look at different parameters. So they looked at um, um, how many how many of the cancer cells were in the bone marrow, the level of the IgM power protein, something called beta two microglobulin, which is a blood factor that we, we measure all the time when you come to clinic, um, as we do albumin. So that's just a normal protein in the blood, um, and they and they looked at lots of other parameters as well and did uh, um, some really hefty number crunching with some very clever statisticians and came up with this predictive model. So these were the 
most predictive factors to then try and work out how soon people are going to need treatment. And when you look at those factors and you put some values in, you can separate people out into three risk groups. So those who've got a, a low, intermediate or high risk of um, time two progression, that's what the TTP stands for. So you can see um, I've plugged in one of my patients results here. Um, is there's a very good website. So actually anybody has access to this. So um, and haematologists will have access to it. And, yeah, as a patient, you can if you get these results, um, you can plug yourself in as well. Um, it's not an absolute thing, but it's it's a I think it's quite helpful. It gives people a sort of a bit of a, a view um, how their disease is likely to behave. I mean, there's always exceptions, but I think it's quite a helpful um, tool. So it's something that I'm going to use and certainly be using more in the future. Excellent. So with that in mind, then, what um, as as my consultant, what uh, what dictates to you when you're going to start treatment with your patients? Yeah. So really, it, it comes down to symptoms. Um, and we've talked about folk who are asymptomatic. Um, we have that's about about 25 percent of patients. Um, Historically, we, we, we used to say we're asymptomatic when we met them. In fact, I would say I'm, I'm probably meeting more people now who are asymptomatic in the clinic. And I think it's because GPs are doing more blood tests and they're looking at antibody levels more often. Um, and, and we're refer, being referred patients earlier, um, is my impression. Um, so looking at symptoms, we can really separate that into sort of a lymphoma related and those related to the paraproteins, naughty antibody. So the lymphoma related symptoms, this is a picture of our lymphatic system. So you can see there's a whole sort of network of plumbing um, and where, the, where, where you've got sort of bendy bits of the body. So in the neck, under the arms, whoops, go back to that, um, uh, tops of the legs. That's where we, we uh, have lymph glands. So we always, when you come to clinic, we always examine you for these, so see if you've got any large glands. Um, the liver and the spleen is part of the lymphatic system. Um, and I always say to people with lymphoma, because um, we're very used to thinking about you know, if lymphoma has spread, or sorry, if a cancer has spread, I think, so Joe Public is very used to thinking if you've got a particular type of cancer and it's it's spread to the bones or it's spread somewhere else, that's more advanced and it's, you're not, you know, it's bad news or can be bad news. Lymphomas are very different because they're a liquid you know, tumor or cancer. And so they can move anywhere in the blood or move anywhere in the lymphatic system. So it's good to think about it as just being one organ. So the lymphatic system, and that's all, all of this here in the diagram, is just one organ. And a, the lymphoma can be anywhere in that, in that site. Um, but with WM, as I've said before, it's, it's mainly the bone marrow. So that's where the cancer cells like to get stuck. Um, you can get enlarged liver and spleen. It's, it's uh, you know, about 20% of people or 15%. Um, what makes WM a bit different to many other lymphomas is that you don't tend to have very large um, lymph nodes. So, I mean, it's possible, but even when they are enlarged, it tends to be sort of more like sort of um, you know, beans and peas rather than big lumps. Um, mm. Of course, there are exceptions to that. Huh? The other thing that we look for, we always ask about people where they've got these weird things called B symptoms, and, and that's um, people having high fevers, drenching sweats, or losing more than 10% of their weight within six months. Um, so these are all sort of symptoms that are very common with uh, um, lymphoma and uh, certainly we can see them with WM. Okay. Um, and so anemia, um, you yeah, again, anemia is basically, it's just a, a nice diagram to show. So the, the red cells, um, if your red cells are reduced, you essentially are anemic, as you can see in the diagram then. Um, there are lots of clues we can pick up visually. So if you look at your um, under people's eyelids, um, or if you look at their fingernails, you see this sort of um, pallor, hmm? so they're very pale. But the symptoms people get um, are a result of not enough oxygen being delivered to the tissues, because the red cells obviously carry oxygen, deliver that to the tissues. So people get tired, short of breath. Um, as you exercise, your oxygen demands are higher. So sometimes you, um, People, particularly people are very fit who um, actually that's one of the first things they notice their exercise tolerance drops off so they can't you know they can't do their 30 mile cycle ride they can manage 20 or 15. Um, you can be dizzy sometimes people get um, palpitations you can see this 
you know, drumming or ringing in the ears. Those are all symptoms of anemia. That's an interesting point, anemia, because I've spoken to so many fellow WMers over the, the time I've been involved with WM. And <clears throat> a lot of us go to our start, all our journey started off with going to the doctors with tiredness and fatigue and et cetera, and being told, well, you've got anemia, you're anemic. And <clears throat> it can take months and sometimes years of being told this before eventually we go down the route of diagnosis of WM. So why doesn't our routine blood test that we get from the GP, why doesn't that pick up WM earlier? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. Um, and um, I mean, one thing I would say is that there are many, many different causes of anemia. Um, and and the commonest um, is actually iron deficiency. So it's not, not related to this slide particularly, but that's, um, so the common things are common. Um, and really the sort of the one key test that will sort of flag up uh, it's probably somebody potentially at risk of WM is looking at antibody levels. Huh? So it won't be sort of the first screening test that GPs do. But I think you're, you're right. It, I, it's a very common story that I hear a lot that people have seen their GP for you know, a, a long time. Often, often you know, it can be months, can even be years before they've been referred and for perhaps the, you know, some of the tests are done. Um, and I think that's yeah, education is really important as well. It's a very rare type of disease. Obviously, you, you can imagine that there's so many different types of blood cancer. Um, but I think, you know, WMUK has got a really big role in that, actually, that we, we really want to um, promote, you know, education, public awareness. So, um, so you yeah, know, it's thought about earlier as the answer. Okay. But going back to... Um, anemia itself in, in WM, there are many, many different causes. So I think as, as that can be a trigger to why we, we want to start you know, actual chemotherapy treatment with patients, we need to be sure what the cause and mechanism of the anemia is. So it could be that there's a, a deficiency. Um, so it could be there's a vitamin deficiency such as B12 or folate, which is easily correctable. And then people wouldn't need to have any treatment in terms of chemotherapy. Um, another really important thing is um, the, the cancer cells themselves can secrete a substance that's called hepcidin. Now, this is a, a factor in the, in the body that's as a master regulator of iron. So when you have very high hepcidin levels, that stops you from absorbing all the iron that you normally need to get from food. And also we've, in the body, we've got iron stores. So, so to control the amounts of iron that are free for use, the body um, you know, stores it in these different systems, something called the reticular endothelial system. And hepcidin stops any iron that's stored from being released into, into the circulation available for cells to use. Um, now, it's relevant because, as I say, quite there's a you know, publication in a number of people that with WM, we've seen high levels of hepcidin and um, your iron stores are low. No matter how much um, iron you have as tablets, it's not gonna, it's not gonna help. Um, and so that situation when people do respond to intravenous iron. Um, and I've got a number of patients who have never needed treatment, but do have to have regular iron infusions. Um, and that's likely because they've got high hepcidin levels. So that's important. And that's an important thing for, for hematologists to be aware of. Okay. Um, and likewise, you can make bad antibodies that destroy the red cells. Um, and treatment specifically just for the um, hemolytic anemia, so the breakdown of the red cells, can you know, stave off having to have any chemotherapy as well. So um, we've talked about the bone marrow infiltration as well. Thank you. So um, in terms of other symptoms, um, thinking more, more about the sort of other sort of lymphoma symptoms, it also depends on really where, where the lymphoma is. Hmm? So you can see somebody here with a, a gland, they've got a sort of a plum-sized lymph node that's very visible and obvious. That's something we could easily pick up in the clinic and you'd be you know, able to pick that up as well. Um, there's a lot actually now that some, um, I know the Lymphoma Association has been, been looking at some um, self-help videos for folk with uh, lymphoma because uh, unfortunately during all of the COVID pandemic, a lot of clinics were done by telephone or some virtual clinics. And so they've got some really good videos just to teach people how to self-assess their own lymph nodes. And I think that's that's quite a good technique, a good thing to do. 
because um, most most clinics will have open access so people suddenly you get a sort of big lump that comes up people just in, in my hospital just pick up the phone ring our ring our day unit and we've got open access for everybody to just be seen yeah um, urgently if needs be now always part of our, our staging before we start treatment we do a ct scan so that's here in the middle um, and that's basically um, somebody lying on their back you can see the spine at the back and they're sort of cut um, you know, through the through the middle um, you can see here um, oops try not to advance the slide there's sort of a big lump this is a white blob there but it's not here so this is the pre-treatment post-treatment and that's a lymph node mass so it's abdominal lymph node mass that you can see there hmm? Right. So, um, and CT is exquisitely sensitive to, to picking up um, abnormal sort of um, swollen glands inside the body that we can't detect when we examine people. Um, and we can get that down to just millimetres. So it's, it's a very important sort of technique that we always would do before we start treatment and then at the end of treatment to assess response. Sometimes um, people occasionally present with um, lymphoma that affects the um, the the lungs or the membrane around the lungs, they can get fluid in the lungs, so that's somebody with uh, pleural effusion, so that's fluid basically there. Um, this is just a picture to show where somebody's having a large spleen, so your spleen's here and the liver's there. Again, that's very easy to detect and we can examine people for that so we can pick it up, but also we can get very accurate measurements from a CT scan. Um, and this is somebody uh, with an MRI scan and just you can see it's a, again, it's a white blob there, and that's when people get involvement in, in the brain itself. Um, and that's a syndrome called Bing Neal syndrome. Uh, and there's Shirley Desar is going to be having to talk to you about that in, a, I think, I believe, the upcoming webinar uh, in the series. Hmm? Yeah, exactly. Oops. So, just back to basics, I think it's, it's worthwhile spending a bit of time on this because it causes a lot of confusion. Um, and, um, and I think it's really important to understand. So, so these plasma cells, they're the antibody making cells. And when they're working normally, they make a, a, just a plethora of lots and lots of different types of antibodies that protect you against all the different infections that you, you are exposed to. So that's, that's them working normally. When they go wrong, um, the, the WM cells are just one flavor of plasma cell. So they will just make one type of antibody that's not a useful antibody. Um, and that's a, what we call a monoclonal antibody. In a, a lot of American sites, they could talk about the M protein, just standing for monoclonal protein, or the power protein. It's all the same thing. And in WM, um, in my experience, actually, that ev everybody will also have at least one um, power protein related symptom. Um, and this is a diagram of the power protein. Um, now in WM, they actually sort of hold hands. We have the IgM goes around as a, a, a big molecule or five antibodies stuck together. And that's why it's, it's very large and that's why it causes some of the, some of the problems. Um, and each of the um, power protein is unique to each um, patient and each WM. Um, so we can, we can like, sequence this part of it and you have a unique sequence. Um, but all that as a result causes unique sort of physical properties and binding properties. Um, and that leads to problems with the blood being too, um, too thick or too sticky. So that's this thing called hyperviscosity. Um, it's a bit of analogous. I think a good way of thinking about it is um, if you compare sort of water to treacle, um, obviously treacle is much thicker and stickier. And, and that's the sort of year when you've got a, a very high IgM, that can happen, that your blood can be much more sticky. Um, so more like a treacle sort of side of things than a, than a, a water. Um, and then it has some of these other problems, um, which I'm going to go on to talk about in a bit. Okay, so you're talking about plasma viscosity. Can that, can that be measured? And if it can be measured, um, one, of our, one of our guys asked, do anticoagulants help? Yeah, so that's a, a really good question. And the answer is it, it can be measured. Um, uh, and it's, you, we basically, it's a blood test, so we can measure the plasma viscosity. It's a very old test, actually, that we used to do in the lab. And in fact, majority of hospitals now in the UK don't, don't have the ability to measure this anymore. Um, I mean, for us in Bournemouth, when we measure it, the, the closest um, lab that does is Bath, <laughs> would you believe? Mm? <laughs> um, but I do, I do sort of measure it at times. Um, 
The reason that we don't routinely do it always is when people have hyperphysical cystity um, as a, a syndrome, it's a clinical diagnosis. So, so um, an absolute level of your um, plasma physical cystity doesn't tell you whether or not you are, you're going to go on to develop hyperviscosity syndrome. And that's, that's become, is a life-threatening condition um, with folk with WM. And it leads to extreme fatigue, headaches, blurred vision particularly. So anybody that gets new onset, sudden blurred vision with headaches or, or just not really being quite themselves, not being so mentally sharp as normal. Um, you can get bleeding. Um, these are all sort of like alert signs I'd really worry about. Um, and that could be you know, signs that people might be getting some hypervisicosicity. Um, now, of course, if you imagine when the blood's flowing through, um, through different vessels, if you've got somebody who's maybe a bit older, who's had some heart disease or who's um, you know, had some strokes, might have some more furring up of the arteries, the arteries are going to be narrower. So they're going to be more at risk of developing hyperphysical cystity at a lower level of blood stickiness, if you like, than somebody who's, you know, in their you know, 40s, you know, runs marathons. Um, so there's a, a bit of a variation of, of who's at risk of hyperphysical cystity. And also um, the actual physical property of that, that particular IgM. So some IgMs, people are more at, at risk. And there's um, sometimes people's IgM reacts in the cold when it's what we call a cryoglobulin. So those folk are more at risk of, um, of getting hyperviscosity as well. Um, so it's it's common. I think it's underdiagnosed because it can be quite subtle. Um, it's important for people who are getting blurred vision to look at their backs of the eyes. So this is looking at somebody's with a, a, fund, a fundoscopy, so a thalmoscope looking at the back of their eyes. So it's the retina. Um, and you can see all the vessels here, which are normal. In WM, you get these very engorged, sort of chunky vessels and these sort of um, blotches. That's where people actually have had some hemorrhage. And that's partly why people get, um, um, get the blurred vision. So the people are at risk of, of bleeding in the back of the eye. So to answer the question about, um, um, about the anticoagulants, no, I mean, I've very often actually, um, people rather than getting blood clots will, will bleed with hyperphysicosity because it will also, when you have a very high level of IgM, it can affect clotting, and all the clotting factors and clotting the cells. Um, what we do know is that folk with, which is slightly aside, folk with any type of lymphoma, including WM, are a bit more prone to getting blood clots. Um, so obviously, in and that's just having a cancer, it makes people's you know, blood a bit more sticky for other reasons and, and not necessarily directly related to the IgM level. So obviously being on a blood thinner, you know, can be protective in, in that sense. Okay. Thanks. I think that, that answers that one. Yeah. So yes, here's my so slide about cryoglobulins. Um, so basically, uh, and what you find is that the, the antibody reacts in the cold. Um, and so this is a test tube. So somebody's had some blood taken at four degrees. You can see there's also precipitant, this sort of milky color, whereas this looks much more normal plasma at, um, at body temperature at 37. Um, and this leads to all kinds of cold related symptoms. So people can get this condition with their fingertips turn blue in the cold. Um, sometimes you also get Raynaud syndrome. So you can get, um, uh, really, really pronounced of white fingertips. Um, and um, when you go back into the warm, they you, quite painful actually. People get, you know, as, as the fingers warm up, get, um, um, will get to uh, um, change color again. Um, now it's important to know, we always need to screen. So um, whenever anybody comes to my clinic as a new patient and, and, um, and normally, you know, once every year I will screen people for, uh, cryoglobulin because people can develop it over time this, this property mm -hmm. so it's important to know um, and that's you know, because it has can cause problem when it's behaving in this way um, it can cause some quite nasty joint pain you can get some um, you know, rashes with it um, it can affect the nerves it can also affect people's uh, um, you can get abnormal liver function tests so it's it's an important thing to screen for okay um, and then, then these are the IgM isn't an antibody, um, and so sometimes it can be misdirected against different tissues in the body. Um, and this is really a slide that of all the different ways it can be misdirected against different things and, and cause cause problems. So 
you can get a, um, it can be directed against red cells. So this is where you can see all the red cells are clumped together. So this is a form of cold um, uh, hemolytic anemia, but you can also get hemolytic anemia where the red cells are destroyed without, without uh, um, this effect in the cold. Um, we've touched on the nerves, so you can get uh, problems that it can attack the nerves. We've talked about the cryoglobulins. There's this very rare condition called Schnitzler syndrome, um, and you people get this sort of um, allergic type rash. It's a very fine rash. Um, again, that's important to know because there are some um, specific treatments for it. Um, and then it can also um, be directed against parts of the control mechanisms of the immune system. So there's a factor called C1 esterase inhibitor, and that's just a, a regulator of, of the immune system. Um, and when it's, so normally, obviously if we have an infection, the immune system goes into overdrive to like you know, clear the infection, kill the bugs, but you've got to have an, an off switch as well. Otherwise you're going to get the extreme allergic reactions. Um, and one of the off switches is this thing called C1 esterase inhibitor, um, but you can get the IgM can be directed against this and it leads to people getting some allergic type you know, reactions and look as though they're, they've got some swelling on their, their lips or you know, swelling in different areas. Mm. So you touched on uh, neuropathy there and that's a big, a big thing that keeps coming up with our, with our WMers is um, many of us get, uh, suffer from peripheral neuropathy to greater or lesser extent. So why do we get peripheral neuropathy in WM? Or is it just a, a side, side issue? Um, well, I don't think it's a side issue. I think it's a really common symptom. And I think uh, it's, um, uh, it's helpful just to look at what the nervous system is. So the two parts, basically. Um, on the left, there's the uh, central nervous system. So essentially that's your brain and your spinal cord. Um, and then we've got all our peripheral nerves. Um, so when we talk about peripheral, uh, um, uh, yeah, peripheral neuropathy, that's what we mean. It's affecting the, the smaller nerves. Um, with uh, affecting the central nervous system, that's the condition called Bing Neal syndrome, which we're not going to talk about today. So there are, again, many, many different causes of neuropathy. So it's really important to, to get a sort of clear history from people and to, to unpick what the problem is because um, treatments are slightly different. Uh, it's very common, up to 24% of folk you know, with WM will have this um, and affects you with people with um, numbness, pins and needles in the fingers or toes, you have an abnormal sensation, can lead to weakness um, and we can, when we examine people can lead to a loss of reflexes. Um, we've also got uh, another set of nerves which are called the autonomic nerves and they're really important in controlling things like the blood pressure. Um, control how the bowels work, how the heart works, um, how the bladder works. And um, it's quite common for folks with WM to also have autonomic neuropathy. So, so that's really important. So, to, so I think doctors looking after um, WM patients, they need to be aware of these, these complications. Quite a lot of mechanisms of how it can happen. Um, it can either be an antibody that's directed against um, um, myelin. And so this is a picture of a nerve. So the nerves like a um, a, a wire, so normally if you've got an electrical wire, we, you have insulation around it, and the myelin is, is a body's insulation around a, a nerve. So if you get damage to the myelin, that nerve's not going to work very well properly. And so you, we have these anti-mag antibodies, which is a myelin associated, so antibodies directed against this bit, the, the outer coating. Amyloid is another problem that can cause it, and cryoglobulinemia, as we've talked about. Mm. So this is really just to say um, what amyloid is, and that's part of the antibody. Um, it's the light chain that's misfolded and it can be laid down as an abnormal protein um, and can affect, affect many different sort of organs. And about 5% so of folk with WM can get it. Um, and it's something that can develop again during the course of the disease. So it's always really important to be aware of it and to think about this as a potential problem. Okay, thank you. Um, and just the last way that, that you know, people can be affected with symptoms, again, is the bleeding. Um, and that's due to either having low platelets, due to the bone marrow not making enough, or we can, uh, um, we can destroy some of the clotting factors. Um, and so people can have a, a, a sort of syndrome that's an acquired haemophilia, so they look a bit like haemophilia, something called acquired von Willebrand's disease, which is quite common. And that's about 15% of 
um, WM will get it. Okay, so we've talked about active monitoring and you, you're talking to us about all this, this chemical stuff going on, but what actually dictates when you, the consultant, are gonna advise us and, and start treatment with us? What, what dictates that point in time? Yeah. Um, well, it's really, it's really that whether people have significant um, symptoms and they're, um, as we've talked about. So, so that's, that's the trigger. Hmm? Um, uh, I mean, it's, it's a tough one, I think, because, um, you know, even folk who are asymptomatic, and one thing I hear a lot from a lot of my patients is that people have a lot of chronic fatigue. Hmm? Um, but um, it would have to be a very, very debilitating before we, we'd want to, to start treatment, just for the reasons we talked about before. So um, in terms of blood parameters, we've got some sort of recognised international um, guidelines uh, really on, on the sort of parameters of when to sort of step in and start treatment. Okay. Um, and I think it's really just to be mindful again that we know that it's, uh, although we've got very effective treatments, um, we want to save these treatments and not try to fix something that's not broken um, because WM does tend to go into this course that you, when people start treatment, you get a really good remission. Um, but then at some point it may become more active again and we'll need to give further treatments. So it's important to, to really save our, our, um, these different treatments when, when it's yeah, the right time. Until we find a cure, of course. Until we find a cure, which we are working on. <laughs> exactly. And I think that's a good point. And I think that as we've got these new agents, that you know, every time a new drug's developed, you know, and, and all of our drugs are getting better and better, and we're getting better and better remissions and deeper remissions, we have to, as, as doctors and researchers, we have to ask the question, and patients as well, well, in that case, should we be treated earlier? Should we start earlier? Mm -hmm. And yeah, the answer is we need to keep looking because... Um, you know, and when we get combinations, there will, you know, maybe in the future, there will be a time that actually we will advise that our treatments are better and that we need to start sooner. Okay. Um, so it's useful, I think, that WMUK have got this uh, registry, which is fantastic. There's a bit out of date this slide. We've got even more patients now, I think, um, registered. But um, but we, we looked at some really, for people who are on the registry and who went on to have the treatment, what the sort of indications were um, and uh, obviously you can see anemia is a really big one um, and generally speaking you know we'd start then when people's uh, haemoglobin is less than sort of um, it's not absolute but less than sort of 10 grams per deciliter um, uh, uh, and causing problems there that's symptomatic and there's no other treatable cause of the anemia. So which treatment is best? Um, I think it's really important to um, oops had some other things there. Yeah, um, target the individuals. You've got to look at sort of patient factors, um, what the health is like otherwise. Have, they got other, yeah, have people got other problems with their health? Are they on other medications? Um, the WM related sort of factors we've talked about. Um, and what, what could the potential complications be? Um, so it's really got to be sort of targeted and individualized, I would say. Um, I think it's also important, an important thing to talk about that actually majority of people with WM don't die from WM, they die from a cause that's unrelated. So it's no good for us as clinicians, you know, make a diagnosis, jumping in, giving treatment that may, may actually give some potentially you know, nasty side effects. Well, actually, you know, um, we've not done you any favours. So I think, I think it's about quality of life and, life and um, we want the best possible treatments that give are going to give the longest remission, but with the least side effects. Um, and that's what we're always striving to get. Yeah, and um, so another question that pops up is uh, how, so for instance, I had bendamustin and rituximab, um, other guys had um, DRC and other guys had other stuff. How, how do you decide which regime you're going to put them on? And, and perhaps a question that came in earlier today was if somebody, for example, has had um, chronic heart failure or you know problems with their heart, would that dictate... I think you've just alluded to that. Would di that dictate what treatment you can or would put them on? Yeah, mm -hmm. um, really, really pertinent question. Um, I mean, at the moment, obviously things are changing. We've just we've just looked at our um, the the British guidelines again. So we're just about to go to press with that. And um, currently, um, what's available in the UK, it, the choice is really between um, 
between two main sort of frontline treatments. So it's a combination called DRC um, and bevacizumab, or tuximab, or thinking about a clinical trial. Um, they're both highly effective treatments. Um, DRC um, is the so so basically um, it's all chem chemo immunotherapy, so the backbone of chemotherapy, uh, together with the tuximab, which is an antibody or immunotherapy. It's a magic bullet that recognizes cancer cells. Um, and um, so, yes, yeah, so that's a sort of the scheme. So the DRC, the cyclophosphamide, which is the chemotherapy tablet is given as tablets. In benzamustard and tuximab, um, you have an injection or infusion on day one and day two, and that's repeated every 28 days. Um, our frontline um, study at the moment is Rainbow, which is Rebecca Auer's study. And that's comparing DRC, which is an international standard, with a Bruce and the Tuximab combination. And this is really that there's no head-to-head -head, um, perspective bar to compare the two. Um, which so to answer you as researchers, we, we really in an ideal world it'd be good to have a head-to-head -head comparison. But there have there have been um, different groups that looked at sort of retrospective sort of series, and and this is really comparing the benzamustine with DRC. Both have very good response rates, so they're, they're excellent. Um, now, the length of time that people stay in remission, there's this thing called progression-free survival, and it looks to be a little bit higher with um, um, BR, so it's looking to be about five and a half years compared to more like um, three years plus with, uh, with DRC. Having said that, um, that's looking at very sort of sets of measurements to see if there's any tiny sort of increase in the um, IgM power protein. And normally, as, as you know, most people, and we've talked about, people can have a very, very slow increase in the power protein and not have any symptoms at all from that. So that's not a reason to start treatment. So actually, in a way, what's more important is looking at the, the, what's more relevant for patients is the time to next treatment, because that's, that's just showing how long you know, the, the benefit, the clinical benefit or real benefit for you guys is, um, and DRC, you're looking at sort of, um, 51 months, so so that's um, over four years at least. Mm -hmm. Obviously, yeah. there's a range. This is a, these are the averages, so you can see yeah. people have, have much longer. Um, and but one of the key things is the time to response. So so um, benzamustard rituximab is a much faster acting um, treatment, um, and um, so you tend to see responses even within two months. Although to get your best response, it can take up to six months, whereas getting the best response to DRC can take 11 months. So after people have stopped it, we generally give six cycles of treatment, you still see people carrying on responding after they've stopped treatment. Um, and to answer your other question, it's, it's really, it comes into toxicity. So although it looks as though people can, you know, perhaps the Ben Muster with Tuxumab may get, um, you know, um, slightly better sort of uh, duration of response, it's at a cost of increased toxicity. So it's a very, it's a very strong treatment. And if you're a few, um, perhaps a bit older, we're not ages, we really look at biological age. So we look at people's sort of, um, um, other sort of health problems. Um, we know that, that on the whole, they're not gonna tolerate the muscle and tuxedo so well. So that tends to be, we tend to give that to people who are younger, fitter, um, this is just looking at, and it's always balancing some really toxicity with the benefit. Um, DRC is very well tolerated in, in, in everybody. Um, low rates of um, neutropenia is, is when you have a low neutrophil count, which is a very important white cell count. So a grade three or four, um, a grade three and above means that you need to be admitted for um, potentially for that um, with the infections. Um, so, the, this is a, looking at the French study, so it's a retrospective study, patients with WM. Um, and they did have a range, so they treated people up to the 85, but on average around 70. Um, but we found because um, it co does cause problems with lower and white cell counts, uh, there are quite a lot of people needed dose reduction, so it's up to 44%. So it's not quite half needs to either reduce the doses or didn't finish the, the full six cycles. Um, and and just over 10% of people got quite severe low white blood cells with it potentially putting people at risk of infection and some life-threatening infections. And also you can get some long-lasting um, reduction in, in white cells or platelets. So 
they're both are very good, but I think you, you need to tailor the treatments and somebody to, to and the art is to be used in, in the sort of fitter patients is the answer. Mm -hmm. OK, and you touched on uh, ibrutinib there, which, uh, as I think most of us know, is a drug, a new drug that came out two, three, four years ago. Um, why is this not a frontline treatment? Uh, and a question from somebody was, if we start on ibrutinib, is there any circumstances under which it could be withdrawn? Yeah. Um, so, um, so really, that's a really good question. I think the, the answer is that, um, uh, well, firstly, uh, at the moment, it's, it's, it is licensed. So Brucenib is licensed for, um, for folk who, who aren't um, able to have chemo in the therapy. So we can't have chemotherapy, it is licensed. One of the restrictions we have in the UK, unfortunately, it's not funded. Mm -hmm. so, um, so we can't use it for that reason. Um, but that's quite rare because most people are able to have some form of chemotherapy. Um, and to answer the question is that we, we don't have the data yet to support it. We know it's a really effective drug, um, but we don't know whether it's going to be better to keep it in reserve until people need it as a second line treatment um, and have that at that point, um, and bearing in mind that it's a maintenance treatment. So once you start a brutinib, you need to stay on it long term and, and we would only stop it when it no longer worked. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that's really the purpose of uh, the current frontline study of backgrounds, which is asking that, that question, is it better to um, you know, give it up front? Huh? Um, and so it, it's uh, people are randomized to having a Bruce in combination with Puxumab to DRC. And that, that study is one of those studies that's gonna answer that question. Okay. Um, uh, to answer your second question about once you start it, no, I think that, that it's, it wouldn't be ethical that obviously at the moment the funding's um, by the Cancer Drug Fund when in the UK, when people start with the Bruce Nib and it, if it's working well and people are, you've got a good remission, it wouldn't be ethical just to stop it or withdraw it. Um, obviously, it is going to be um, going to appraisal again and, and really we need to look to see whether NICE is going to take out the funding. Um, I'd be optimistic that, that they will, but of course, until we've gone through that battle, mm -hmm. I can't, we can't say for sure. Um, good thing, I think, on the, um, with a Bruce with those family of drugs is that there's a whole, um, there are two new drugs which are, um, are just at the point of about to be licensed in WM. So there's son of Ibrutinib, which is a calobrutinib, which uh, quite a lot of our, my patients are, are on a clinical trial with. So that's very effective. And actually the early data shows that it's probably got less, few less side effects than Ibrutinib. Um, and then there's Zanubrutinib, which is the Beijing uh, BTK inhibitor. Um, and there are more um, following up behind. So there's um, um, a really exciting drug um, which are uh, called LOXO, which is, looks as though people who might have progressed from a BTK inhibitor, this family, have still had some responses with this new BTK inhibitor. So, so I think the good news is there's lots of trials coming, there's lots of drugs coming, um, but we don't have the data yet to support using it as, as a front line. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're just coming up to the hour mark, and I just want to ask you one last question that a couple of people um, have, have alluded to, and that's, during our recent lockdown, um, we've been having telephone consultations um, instead of coming in to see you. And <clears throat> invariably, we end up, uh, we're being rung by a registrar, one of your registrars. And I just want to ask you, is, is this normal? And in that case, has your registrar talked to you about, for example, my case, um, and if you're happy, you're happy for your registrar to ring me and talk to me about it. Or would you, if my blood readings came back or anybody's blood readings came back as a little bit worrying, would you as the consultant, the lead consultant, uh, make that phone call? Yeah. So, I mean, we, I think the first thing to say, and it's, it's um, you know, true in my clinic, and I think, I think all of the WM clinics and, and most, not all, but, but many haematology clinics that we, we do have our registrars. So they, they're specialised in haematology, but they are, they are in training. It's very important. So I think particularly with diseases like WM, I feel very strongly that they, they, it's essential they come to the clinic because we don't have that many specialist clinics still in WM. And I think it's, Really, I've, I think all of the 
the, uh, those of us that do specialise in WM, we're on a bit of a mission and we want to educate our up and coming haematologists. They've got to have experience, they've got to understand the disease because it's, it's a really challenging disease and they've really got to understand all these complications. Um, but in terms of blood results, I mean, whenever you, any patient get, gets their bloods taken or gets scans taken, all of the results, a hard copy will come back to me to so land on my desk. So I will see the results of all my patients. Mm -hmm. So I know what's going on. Um, so, um, but it's important that, that the registrars do phone um, and, and it's important that registrars get experience in seeing people at all stages of, of WM, not just people that are well, because otherwise they're never gonna understand you know, the, the triggers of when they need to sort of pick up on there's a problem. Um, but no, they, they wouldn't be making any decisions about any treatment or, you know, when to start treatment or what type of treatment or even to stop treatment without discussion with with the consultant so, okay. so no, we're, we're in charge but they they um they do need to to you know, understand and, and get experience in wm as well well you know me helen i'm mr positive so i've gone the last year listening to your registrars thinking well that's good i must be okay and the day that helen rings me is going to be a bad day but uh, but it wasn't because you rang me last time and it was still a good day so thank you for that <laughs> um, Helen that, that's, that's taken us up to just over the hour and it's been a really fascinating talk and I think you've answered a lot of our questions um, I just want to say a big big thank you from all of us on today's meeting and, and also from us at WMUK for taking an hour out of your day or more than an hour because you've prepared um, to give us his insight into the general aspect of uh, WM and as you say we're going to be doing some specialist subjects as we go on through the uh, through the year and um, just thank you so much and uh, I look forward to seeing you next month in clinic. You're very you're very welcome and, and I, I just wanted to say a big thanks to you Bob and, uh, and actually to WMUK because I think it's a fantastic organisation and I'm, I'm so pleased that it's grown from strength to strength and I think it's really important that we continue to support it so no thank you to you. Thank you so much. See you later, Helen. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, -bye. Hi, buddy. Bye, everybody. Thank you for joining us. And uh, keep an eye open for all of our other webinars that are coming up through the summer. And um, I look forward to seeing you all again.